Science Central. On the one hand, Shanghai is a city that embodies newness, sprawling development, modern architecture, and bustling commerce. But you don't need to go far to find the old and traditional within, which made it a natural place for a forum on China's effort to advance public scientific literacy. China is, is a country that, like many other uh, countries, that is in the process of modernization. Uh, they've had a very traditional culture. Uh, the majority of Chinese citizens are still farmers, um, and the great majority of those have very limited literacy of any kind. Seven of us from the United States, led by Joan Farini Mundy of the National Science Foundation, were invited to participate in a two-day forum held during China's National Science Week. We were there to discuss what the Chinese call popularization of science. What I was hoping to learn was about the state of research and evaluation around issues of what we call informal science education and what here is called popularization of science. And um, I did learn that these are actually slightly different concepts but with um, a lot to be gained by each of them uh, sort of informing the other. And while the opening reception had the pomp and circumstance of a summit meeting, our interactions quickly became as informal as the kind of education we were there to discuss. I was pleased and surprised, I guess, at the mix between formal um, sort of ceremonial approaches to, to uh, interaction and how quickly that could shift into very deep and interesting discussions. The forum was held at the Shanghai Science and Technology Museum, a 98,000 square meter, $180 million marvel. Several hundred Chinese educators, scientists, and government officials attended the event, and each of us spoke about our area of expertise. Walter Stavolo from the Association of Science Technology Centers talked about organizing so-called extreme science events. That you can use this toolkit to create worldwide events where people use the toolkit at the same time to do the same things. John Miller from Michigan State University talked about evaluating public scientific literacy. So that the model that we have to think about is a just-in-time system of learning. Longtime Science Center executive Sheila Grinnell talked about how scientists can better communicate with the public. The communications channels have their own rules, and the scientists may not know them. Kim Cavendish, president and CEO of the Museum of Science and Discovery in Florida, talked about the role and function of science centers. We say, try this. Not just learn this, know this, try it, see what happens. Tina Phillips, ornithologist from Cornell University, talked about the emergence of citizen science projects like her studying birds. Uh, instead of the scientists gathering the data, it is a volunteer network of participants that we engage to gather the data for us. And I was representing Science Central, a company that covers science for television news networks. I talked about the role of the media. They think their audience doesn't want to hear about science. We have to convince them that they should put our stories on the air anyway. We also shared the stage with our counterparts from China. Their goal is to dramatically improve the overall scientific literacy of the Chinese public in the next couple of decades. They wanted to meet because, according to John Miller's research, the proportion of American adults who qualified as scientifically literate increased from 10% in 1988 to 28% in 2005. Professor Ding Cheng Ren of Peking University was part of an experts panel that created the Chinese government document called the National Action Scheme of Scientific Literacy for All Chinese Citizens. I seldom attend so-called academic meetings or conferences because I can hardly learn anything from them. But this time, from this forum, through my dialogue and conversations with U.S. scientists, I learned a lot, such as the Citizen Science Bird Study, the Polar Research Projects, and how promoting scientific literacy happens among the American people. Ren says he planned to take the new ideas with him back to Beijing. When I return, I will propose to the chairman of the Chinese Association of Science and Technology that we need to support such action. And also, I noted that the Chinese media is not doing very well at providing scientific news and promoting scientific literacy, so that's a very important question. But for all the concern of our Chinese hosts, there was so much they were doing well. All of us were downright awed by the quality and scope of Shanghai's Science Museum. Like four or five other science centers combined, it's enormous, very well thought out, 
intellectually sound in, in its premises and leaping way far ahead in generations in the actual communications technologies that are used. It's hard to explain how much they have packed into one gigantic building. It was a very intense experience visiting that museum and I imagine it must be very intense for the Chinese visitor. Their exhibition techniques were extremely sophisticated. Absolutely the latest thing in virtually every exhibit we saw. We were really surprised by the quality of what they already have and it was really <laughs> surprising that they had all these questions to cast because they do things at least as good as we, uh, we do them. And it wasn't all just for show. Take this unassuming building on the outskirts of the city. Inside was the Energy Conservation and Supervision Center. It serves the dual purpose of museum for the public, but also training center for China's district energy managers, as the center's resident engineers explained. We got a fund from Shanghai Economic Committee uh, to do this exhibit because Shanghai Economic Committee is saying, uh, you know, energy efficiency is getting more important. The small yet elegant and informative exhibits were comprehensive and inspiring. A few were sent by the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. Very clearly, explicitly laid out what you can do about it in very common everyday, everyday terms and a separate training center where they could actually talk with these individuals. And while it's true that in the few days we were there, we were looked upon as the experts helping consult the Chinese on their policy matters. You're like a movie star. <laughs> All of us ended up going home thinking there was a great deal we learned as well. I was amazed at how um, possible it seems to move things to scale really quickly and efficiently here. I mean, it's difficult to understand the insides of that on such a short visit, but it was one area where I was thinking we could probably learn a lot. In the two days, we have not answered everything, and so I'm very much looking forward to the next steps and to repeat these kind of uh, events in the future. I'm just looking forward to what comes next out of this because I think the, the bridge has been laid, the foundation has been built and it's just a matter of time before some of those connections start to happen uh, on a much more international scale.